Hi everyone, in this video we will be talking about inverse functions and their derivatives. So first let's discuss what is an inverse function. So we say that two functions f and g are inverse functions if f of g of x and g of f of x are both just the function x. So what does this mean? This means that basically f and g undo one another, right? So if I plug something into g, I get some output, right? So like, let's say g of one is three, then this means that f of three is going to be one, right? And so then f of g of one gives me one back, for instance. So uh, what's going on graphically there? Well, let's take the examples of f of x is e to the x and g of x is the natural log of x. So these are inverse functions. You've hopefully seen this before, that e to the natural log of x is x, and same with the natural log of e to the x. And so what we'll notice is that their graphs are reflected across the line y equals x. So this is e to the x, this one on the right is the natural log of x, and you can see that uh, the natural log of x's graph is just the graph of e to the x reflected across the line y equals x. And this is in general the property of inverse functions, that to get the inverse you just reflect over this line. So basically what we can take from that uh, graphical interpretation is that if the point AB is on the graph of f, i.e. if f of a equals b, then BA is on the graph of F inverse, that is F inverse of B is equal to A. And this leads to what you've probably seen before in terms of solving for inverse functions. We will not really do this very often, but just a quick example, you've probably seen in the past that if Y is X plus three to find the inverse, you switch the roles of X and Y. That's exactly because of this reflection. And so you do something like X equals Y plus three and then solve for Y to get x minus three, and so then f inverse, uh, or sorry, I guess in this case, y inverse. So if y is f of x, then f inverse of x is x minus three. And it's pretty easy to check that these are inverse functions. If you add three and then subtract three, you get back what you started. If you subtract three and then add three, you get back what you started. So inverse functions actually don't always exist. So we wanna ask ourselves, when do they exist? When am I gonna have an inverse function? So let's think first of what can go wrong. So I'm gonna give you as an example. So let's think of f of x equals x squared. So in this case, right, f of one is one and f of negative one is one. So we have a couple issues here, right? So one option you might take, so if I'm thinking, what is f inverse of one? Uh, well, you could try and take both of them and say one and negative one, but then f inverse is not a function, right? I said inverse function. Uh, and so this would not pass the vertical line test. And so we would have a problem. Uh, so then you might say, okay, well, I can't pick both of them, so I just choose one. And so I make it an or instead of an and there. But then this is also a problem because, well, why one and not the other, right? Uh, I seem to be losing information. So um, that's not really good either. And so x squared is actually a function that does not have an inverse, and it's because I have two inputs going to the same output. So in general, a function has an inverse if it is what is called one-to-one. -one. And so this, this basically means that for every output, there is only one input that goes to it. And so an easier way to interpret this for us is, i.e., uh, it passes the horizontal line test. So you're used to seeing the vertical line test, right? For functions, the horizontal line test is similar, just using a horizontal line instead of a vertical line, and it's going to exactly track whether you have more than one input going to the same output. So. The horizontal line test says if your function f crosses every horizontal line no more than one time, so I mean it doesn't have to cross it at all, uh, then f is one to one and we'll have an inverse. So I'll give you an example, right? So just something like this, right? Any horizontal line that I draw will only intersect my graph once. Um, 
you know, if I had another one that had asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, for instance, right, they're going to be horizontal lines that are not crossed, right, the ones above and below these asymptotes. And so that's fine, too. It's no more than one, so zero is okay. But then, of course, so these guys are fine, this is fine, this is fine. An example that's not fine is, like I said, x squared. And you can clearly see that we have a ton of horizontal lines that are crossed more than one time. All right, so now we're going to talk about inverse trig functions. So here's the graph of sine, and of course, you know, this keeps going up and down, oscillating. Uh, and so the first thing you may notice is we have horizontal lines that are going to cross our graph uh, more than one time. And so you think, okay, this shouldn't have an inverse, and you'd be right. So what we do to ensure that we do have an inverse is we restrict our attention to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And the nice thing about this is that all of the values in the range of sine from negative 1 to 1 are hit on this interval. So uh, essentially, we're still able to see the full range, even if we restrict our domain to this little portion. right? So we end up with something like this. It's pretty poorly drawn, but it's fine. Uh, so we can define an inverse here. So we'll usually call it arc sine of x, but you may also see it written as sine inverse of x. Um, the only issue with that is you don't want to confuse it with the negative 1 power, and so that's why I will usually try to refer to it as arc sine. And so what this means is, so if y is arc sine of x, this just means that x is sine of y. So the way that you want to think of this is y is the angle you plug in to sine to get x. So just an example, right? So uh, arc sine of 1, for instance, is going to be pi over 2. Why? Well, sine of pi over 2 is 1. And arc sine is saying, what angle do I plug into sine to get 1? It's going to be pi over 2, right? Um, and then for arc sine of, say, negative 1, you would probably think immediately like 3 pi over 2. But this is actually not correct. And the reason is, again, we have like restricted our attention. So we're only looking at y between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So while sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, that's not the domain we're looking at. So we would actually say this is negative pi over 2, because that's the value between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 that gets us negative 1. So continuing, continuing along those lines, we also have arc cosine and arc tangent. And for similar reasons, right, like all of these are periodic, um, we have to restrict our attention. So here we're looking for x is cosine of y, where y is between 0 and pi inclusive. And for arc tangent, um, in this case, right, you have asymptotes at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. And so we will restrict our attention there um, to between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. But the inequalities are strict because of those vertical asymptotes. Okay. And then those vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes when you look at the inverse arctan because you're flipping your x and y coordinates, essentially. So for your first exercise, I want you to just practice with some of these. So find arc sine of root 2 over 2 and arc cosine of negative 1, right? And remember to make sure you're within uh, the bounds provided there. So now we'll talk about derivatives of inverse functions. So we'll talk about general ones first and then kind of focus on trig. So if I have y is f inverse of x, then this means the same thing as saying that f of y is x. And the, the issue, right, is to take the derivative of the left side, like I need to know how to take the derivative of f inverse. I don't know how to do that. But if I turn it into something where I just have f, I can talk about its derivative without worrying about the inverse part. So here I have a function of y on the inside, and y is something that depends on x. So I'm using implicit differentiation here and the chain rule. 
Okay, and so if I take the derivative of each side, all right, so I'm going to take d, dx of fy equals x, then I'm going to get uh, f prime of y dy dx equals 1. And then I just solve for dy dx. So this is 1 over f prime of y. But I know what y is, right? y is f inverse of x. So I can substitute in, and I get 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. And so this is the derivative of the inverse. This is the formula. Okay. So let's verify this with an example. So I've already mentioned previously when we introduced inverse functions, the examples of e to the x and the natural log of x. So here, we know their derivatives already. So we can just check that this formula works, right? So in this case, f prime of x, since f of x is e to the x, is e to the x itself. And we know that f inverse prime is the derivative of natural log, which should be 1 over x. So let's see if this actually works out the way we want it to. Right, so 1 over f prime of f inverse x is we plug in f inverse of x, aka the natural log of x, to f prime. So this becomes e to the natural log of x, and e to the natural log of x is exactly x. So it works out. So for your second exercise, I want you to consider the function 3 fourths x plus 2, just a line. And then I want you to find the inverse. We discussed a method for doing that earlier. Uh, find its derivative here. And then we want to check that the derivative of the inverse works out like we want. So I want you to find this intermediate step of f prime of f inverse of x and verify, lastly, that 1 over that is indeed f inverse prime because you should be able to take f inverse prime from what you find in part A. Thank you for watching.